We are so excited to be speaking to Ilan Pape, an Israeli historian and political scientist. He's a professor with the College of Social Sciences and International Studies at the University of Exeter and director of the university's European Center for Palestine Studies and co-director of the Exeter Center for Ethno-Political Studies. He is someone who challenged the Zionist historiography of Israel, as we'll get into in this interview. He also left Israel because his university in Israel wanted him out after he pledged his support for BDS. So he's a very brave voice. He's joining us from Haifa, Israel. He is teaching next semester again in Exeter, but he's in Haifa at the moment. He's the author of several really great books, including The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, Modern Palestine, and this amazing book, 10 Myths About Israel, which is very readable and I highly recommend. All right, let's go to Ilan Pape. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pape, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you in this podcast. So many questions for you, but I wanted to ask you about how you became the person you are kind of politically. We interviewed Gideon Levy the other day, and I asked him the same question because it's so rare to find people with your view of uh, Israel and your view of Zionism. And obviously you uh, studied history. I know that that was a big part of it, but can you kind of walk us through from the beginning how your view of Israel changed over time? Yeah, definitely. Um, it was a journey, first of all. It doesn't happen in one day. There's no uh, epiphany. There's no kind of a wake up uh, moment. Uh, and uh, the journey, I suppose, for different people takes different uh, trajectories. In my case, I think it began uh, with the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon uh, because it was obviously not a war of choice. And it kind of shed light on other wars or raised questions of other wars before 1982. And this happened also at the time where I decided to be a professional historian. Namely, I was uh, already enrolled in a PhD program uh, at the University of Oxford in, in Britain, deciding both to look at 1948 as the main subject uh, but also to do it with the uh, supervision of an Arab professor, which kind of, of course, brought into a perspective I was less aware of before I came uh, to Oxford. So I think the formative period was the, these uh, early, uh, early 1980s, uh, and it was enhanced by the first intifada, uh, where it was impossible to demonize the Palestinians as the Israelis did, given what we knew about the mode of resistance and the way it shaped. Uh, I would say by, by the early 1990s, the, the journey was completed in many ways, and I was already out of the tribe, so to speak, and uh, already persuaded that both my research results and my better understanding through more intimate relationship with the Palestinians, uh, created kind of a solid position from which I don't think I withdrew uh, ever since. And was there an archive or a document that you saw in the archive that was particularly um, eye-opening for you? I think it was a bunch of uh, or a bunch of ar- documents rather than one, and these were particularly documents which I think were kind of uh, describing in a very military language what was done or was about to be done to the Palestinians uh, as human beings. So it was this kind of dehumanization that could be uh, think of an example, uh, an order that would say occupy the village Uh, burn its houses, uh, expel the people or kill the men. And then it also gives a a kind of a more specific definition for men as people from the age of 18, something from the age of 14. Uh, This kind of uh, language and orders shook me uh, and really ran contrary to what I was taught or believed. Uh, about the Israeli army 
Uh, and uh, I think these kinds of documents, more than any others, uh, began to, first of all, normalize the Zionists, because I don't think they are the only soldiers who did these things. But it was more than that, because once you co connected the, dot, the dots, when you connected these documents, uh, you, you could see a much more, uh, a, a more strategic, strategic uh, uh, planning of this dehumanization. So it was more structural dehumanization rather than just uh, an aberration here and there. And, and then I re-understood some of the early documents I saw, like Plan Dalet, Plan D of the uh, Jewish paramilitary groups Haganah, it suddenly, I read it a bit differently than I read it in the first place, as really, as I called it later on, as a master plan for the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. And for people who don't know that, what those plans are, could you just give kind of an overview of why uh, you do consider the founding of Israel to be a plan of ethnic cleansing? Yeah, th these were these were documents that indicated a very systematic uh, uh, plan of dispossession of as many Palestinians as possible from as many parts of historical Palestine as possible. Uh, this was um, a very clear translation of an ideology that regarded the Palestinians as the main obstacle for the creation of a Jewish democratic state, either on parts of Palestine or all over Palestine, depends on which Zionist group we were talking about. That, that meant that uh, the Plan Dalet, for instance, uh, was a very clear uh, kind of uh, manual for the forces of how to get rid massively of people who lived in neighborhoods and in villages. So it kind of listed very graphically the actions that the troops should take uh, when uh, occupying a village or occupying a neighborhood. Uh, the bottom line was that eventually they have to expel everyone and uh, uh, demolish whether the neighborhood or the village so the people would not have a way of coming back or would not have a place to come back to. Uh, and, and that was a very clear uh, kind of systematic planning that, uh, you know, if you compare it to legal literature or scholarly literature, or even popular literature on what ethnic cleansing means, it really fits like a hand to a glove uh, as a classical case of ethnic cleansing. And in light of what you know about Israeli history, from its start, how does this current moment sit with you? Are you surprised by the scale of the brutality of Israel inside Gaza right now? Not entirely surprised, and yet I think this is, the brutality is far worse than I thought it would be. Uh, I mean, I knew that the Israeli uh, reaction to the 7th of October would be brutal. I have no doubt. I didn't think it would be that brutal. Uh, uh, not only uh, in terms of, which is the most important thing, of course, in terms of what is being done on the ground, but also in terms of the language that uh, accompanies the actions. Uh, it's, it's like all the filters that Israel used to put on its, on its explanation for operations uh, have been removed. So uh, a prime minister that quotes from the Bible and saying we will do to the Palestinian what the Hebrew people did to the Amalek, which, as those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament, you know that according to the Old Testament, God gave the license to the Hebrew tribe to genocide to the last baby, the people of Amalek who were uh, sitting in, in the land of Canaan. Uh, so, you know, using that metaphor, comparing the Palestinians to the Nazis, um, talking about wiping out uh, the Hamas and sometimes wiping out Gaza altogether. Uh, I mean, I knew it was there in the background. I thought people were at least aware that this is a bit problematic, even for them. So I was surprised at this um, idea. I understand it now better. I think I think what, what they thought, when I say they, I mean Israeli military and political leadership, right? I think what they thought was that the immediate kind of solidarity shown by the governments in the West, for example, donning 
uh, the Eiffel Tower with the Israeli, with the colors of the Israeli flag or donning the House of Parliament in Britain with the colors of, uh, uh, of the Israeli flag meant uh, a carte blanche, not only to do what they want, but also to talk about it as they wish without any fear of being condemned. And, uh, uh, and I think that explains why they let everything out in terms of operations and the language that uh, describes them. So that was a bit of a surprise. I mean, I thought it would be a bit more tamed, but uh, I, I, I think I understand why it happened now the way it did, as I just tried to, to, to explain. I have a lot of questions for you about Hamas, about this moment, about um, how you've described what's happening as incremental genocide. But I think it would be helpful before getting into today to talk a little bit more about the history, because as your very good book, 10 Myths About Israel, lays out, this is a case where history really informs the present. And I think a lot of people, if they understood the history, would be a lot of people who aren't already sympathetic to Palestinians if they understood the history and were exposed to your debunking of myths would actually have a far different understanding of the present moment. Can you talk about how some of these kind of foundational myths and, and not just foundational myths, but um, revisionist myths of, of history affect where we are today and, and help explain the demands of Palestinians? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it's very important to put the events of the 7th of October uh, within an historical context. Um, and, and the historical context at least should go back to 1948. Some people would rightly maybe even go to an earlier period, but definitely, oh, sorry, definitely to, to uh, 1948 because uh, 1948 was the, the moment that you, as an historian, you understand the real nature of the Zionist uh, project and the Palestinian reaction to that project. So, so in 48, uh, it's very clear that Zionism falls into the category of settler colonial movements, these movements of European refugees that on, not only uh, arrived as Jews in Palestine, but arrived as Christians in North America, uh, in South America, in Australia and other places, and, and people who really had to leave Europe in many ways uh, uh, and uh, wanted to create a new Europe somewhere else, but chose someone else's homeland as the new place and uh, as the late great uh, scholar of uh, uh, settler colonialism Patrick Wolf says in the moment of the encounter with indigenous people a logic of the elimination of the native was activated elimination that in North America took the form of genocide and in Palestine first took the form of ethnic cleansing so I think in 1948 what you have is the historical moment in which the settler colonialism movement of Zionism has the historical opportunity as the historical opportunity to implement its ideas from before of how best to make Palestine a Jewish state and how to make it even a democratic state. I mean, ironically, because they, they wanted so much a democratic state, they needed a demographic exclusivity, namely, to put it in, in simple terms, Israel wanted to get to its first election in 1949 with a huge, if not exclusive, Jewish uh, majority. And the only way of doing it was to uproot the Palestinians. There was no other way. The demographic balance was such that you could not have a democratic Jewish state. Until today, this is the main problem uh, for Israel. So it begins with this idea that uh, how to make Palestine Jewish and de-Arabize it, if, if you want. And 48, and I won't go, there's no time for it, but 48 is, is the moment that this uh, opportunity uh, appears uh, uh, for, for the young state of Israel to... to uh, perpetrate uh, the ethnic cleansing. Now, the relevance of what happened there to, to today is, in many ways, in the last stages of that ethnic cleansing, uh, uh, which created the Gaza Strip. I mean, what people uh, tend to forget is that the Gaza Strip did not exist before 1948. There wasn't a strip. Gaza was a very nice city surrounded by beautiful countryside that enjoyed the fact that it was located on Via Maris, the road from uh, uh, Egypt to the north, a and it was a cosmopolitical uh, part uh, of Palestine. Now, Israel created this rectangle, as you, one can see on the map, uh, of Gaza as a receptor for all the refugees it expelled uh, from the central and south of Palestine. And the last wave 
of the expellees, or those who were expelled by Israel, lived in villages on whose ruins, actually, the settlements that the Hamas attacked on the 7th of October were established after their ruination. Uh, uh, so, so that's one historical context that I think is important. Then you have a more recent, if you want, historical context. And this is the, uh, everything that happened since 1967, uh, uh, 56 years of ruthless military uh, occupation uh, that uses uh, uh, means that are usually reserved to maximum security prisons in order to incarcerate millions of Palestinians in two mega prisons, one in the West Bank and one in the Gaza Strip, uh, through collective punishment, uh, arrest without trial, killing of people, uh, expel expelling people, and at the same time allowing Jewish settlements to be built on uh, uh, expropriated Palestinian land, uh, who develop their own subculture of racism and fanaticism that is directed against the Palestinian uh, population. And it didn't matter whether you lived in Gaza or in the West Bank, it's one big family. So whatever happened to people in the West Bank affected the people in Gaza. And then we have, of course, the third and most important uh, uh, context, which is the last 17 years of siege that included four bombardments from the air since 2006 on the people of Gaza, one of the most dense areas in, in the world. People, young people, if you think about it, most of the people who participated in the operation uh, were born into the siege reality. They knew no other reality. They, they were born into the form bombardments. I don't think if people all, always understand what does it mean to be in an urban area when F-16s and later F-35 bomb your neighborhood. This is something that you don't recover. Even if you have uh, uh, survived the attack, you don't recover. It's, it's a trauma for life that, that people can, can hardly deal with. And definitely Gaza didn't have, doesn't have in the last 17 years any mechanism to deal with these traumas. And they are added traumas to the trauma. So, so you have this uh, historical context of, of le uh, recent years and more distant past, but it all together is, is uh, a history of what I think one can call incremental genocide, not just in Gaza, because for good or for worse, the Palestinians are the worst problem of the Jewish state, and I say ironically, of the Jewish democratic state even. And this is why the liberal Zionists are so complacent, uh, complacent in all of this, or complicit, I'm, I'm sorry, complicit in all of this, uh, uh, because uh, the, the only way you can impose on millions of people the idea that their homeland is not their homeland, and they have other, the, either the options of leaving or being in an apartheid system, the only way you can do it is with violence and more violence, and with force. And of course, people resist. They always resisted, and they will continue to resist, however uh, the events uh, will unfold later on in the Gaza Strip. And how do you balance discussing October 7th? Because I know, like, for a lot of people, it's very hypocritical, right? They, they don't care about violence against Palestinians, and they do care about violence against Israelis. And so... There's been a lot of, of, of discourse around that, about kind of showing the double standards, the lack of symmetry. But how do you, as a leftist and as a, someone who has uh, defended the human rights of Palestinians, um, kind of grapple with judging what happened on October 7th? Because a lot yeah. of people don't know how to do it. They don't want to condemn it. I've heard you like praise the, the bravery of some of the people who took place who took part in that, but also I've heard you condemn the violence. So how do we balance that? I know it's yeah. a hard question, but. No, no, it's not. A, it's, a, it's a very important question. Uh, it's not about the historical context. It's about the moral context. Right. Uh, and the moral context is important. It, it's important. And, and therefore I distinguished uh, between the military operation, uh, namely attacking the bases and the soldiers who are actually uh, the gaulers of the Gaza ghetto. And 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 uh, and uh, the bravery of attacking, uh, what I think it was eight military bases, uh, and uh, taking uh, captive tanks and so on, uh, uh, by by these people who were ghettoized for seventeen years. And I distinguish between that 
And the brutality shown either by the same uh, guerrilla fighters or by citizens who followed them from the Gaza Strip, it doesn't matter who did it, who, who committed the war crimes. I don't think there's any other way of describing uh, what they did in, in the civilian area. However, uh, I was myself a soldier uh, in the 1973 war. Uh, I don't know of any uh, moral arm, any moment where armies behave morally when they are in the midst of a civilian space. Uh, that's why I became also a pacifist, not just a leftist, because there's no way within uh, the, the civilian space uh, that uh, uh, atrocities would be, be avoided. So that, that's one thing. I mean, it doesn't justify it. Of course, it doesn't justify it. And I think it, it actually was acted a bit of a boomerang against the Hamas, this additional action against uh, uh, the civilians. Um, uh, so, but more importantly, I think, the moral context which is important is to know that as an historian of anti-colonialist movement and of resistance movement and, and movements against any kind of oppression in our modern times and even uh, more distant past, uh, it, it's very difficult to find liberation movements or movements who fought against oppression that didn't have these moral aberrations, if you want, that these moments uh, that uh, are violation of international law, if you want, or, or, or atrocities. And one should not be afraid of calling them atrocities. The, the issue is not condemning, or is not only condemning the atrocities, but to ask whether this condemnation uh, invalidates the justice of the, tr of the struggle. And, and for me, it's very clear that it doesn't. I mean, nothing that happened on the 7th of October changes my uh, uh, total moral, political, and social support for the Palestinian liberation struggle. There's nothing there that happened that makes me question the justice of that uh, 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 liberation struggle, which is what is important. And I always uh, uh, mention two, two historical facts, which are interesting, I think, in that context. Uh, to understand this moral uh, position. Uh, uh, there is the, the famous massacre of uh, slave owners by Nat Turner in 1831, uh, which was condemnable, of course, but did not lead anyone to, to uh, invalidate the justice of the struggle against slavery. And the massacre by uh, the uh, members of the Algerian liberation movement in 1962, in, in July 1962, they massacred settlers and their families, French settlers and their families in the city of Oran in Algeria. But nobody said after that that because of that, the struggle for the liberation of Algeria is unjustified just because you have these, these ideas. So we can explain why these things happen. We can understand the situation that happened. We can condemn what we want to, what we should condemn. But uh, to say to us, which is what the Israelis and their supporters in America tell us, you cannot say but, you cannot say there is a context. You remember the, the vicious attack on the Secretary General of the United Nations when he said that the Hamas operation has to be is condemned, but he wants to understand it was a context. This didn't is, happen in a vacuum. Didn't happen in a vacuum. This is very worrying because what the Israelis want to do is to use that event to absolve them from all their criminal policies before the 7th of October and definitely to provide this moral uh, support for what they're doing now. And this is why we should insist on the context, because otherwise you will remain with a pretext. Mainly the Israelis are using 7 October as a pretext to do what they always wanted, regardless of how many people were killed and how these people were killed, right? Which right. is something, actually I feel much more, uh, I feel morally authentic and trustworthy and, and genuine in my, in my sorrow for, for what happened to the young men and women uh, and children they were attacked. Some of them, I, I know the families myself. Uh, uh, I feel much, I think my sympathy is far more genuine than that of the Israeli politicians in general who, who are using that as a pretext rather than as a, a, as a reaction because they're so, so troubled by what happened. Well, speaking of historical context, I want to read you a quote that I know you're familiar with. This is from Moshe Dayan. He is a famed Israeli military leader. And in 1956, 1956, he spoke at a funeral for an Israeli soldier 
who had been killed by some Palestinians living in Gaza. And Diane said this, he said, let us not cast the blame on the murderers today. Why should we deplore their burning hatred for us? For eight years, they have been sitting in the refugee camps in Gaza, and before their eyes, we have been transforming the lands and villages where they and their fathers dwelt into our estate. That's Moshe Dan in 1956. So I wonder if you can talk about that quote uh, and the significance of it in Israeli history. I know it's very famous. He goes on to say, though, that rather than making peace with these people, we need to be basically be even more aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, well, you have, probably you have to be an Israeli to, to understand why it sounds so logical to Israelis to say that the Palestinians have all the right to hate us, to fight against us, uh, even to kill us. And that's why we have all the right to do the same to them. I, I remember uh, when I just appeared on the public uh, stage in Israel in the early 90s, as a new historian, as they used to call me, I gave lectures in, in various places. And one of them was the Weizmann Institute, where you have these uh, scientists who see everything in black and white. It's very, very difficult to talk with scientists on moral issues. They, 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 they have this blockade that allows them to do all kinds of things later on to animals and human beings, but that, put that aside. They were the most receptive audience I had when, in a time when a lot of people I talked to in Israel very uh, antagonistic to what I told them I found in the archives, either did not believe me or claimed that I didn't understand and so on. So it was very difficult to, to have a dialogue with Israeli Jewish society. They said, wow, we didn't know all these things. But now we understand that we have no other choice but to destroy them because of what they did to them. I, I Because my mind doesn't work like this, I cannot comment too too much about it because but i'm so familiar with it i'm so familiar with it it, it kind of creates a peace of mind in these people a, a peace of mind by saying oh we understand what they're doing mm -hmm. and well you know I, but but let's 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 face it if you really go a bit deeper into diane's speech uh, the it was a eulogy on, on Rui, uh, uh, Greenberg. The guy, the guy who was who was killed. If you go deeper, you can see that this is actually a dehumanization of the Palestinians. It's almost like uh, a hunter who would say, "I really respect the bravery of the lion that I'm going to kill." Uh, it, it's not a respect for human beings because if he if he really thought that way, at least he should have considered right of return, right? <laughs> At least you should consider stopping the, the operations against the Palestinians. But that was not at all the trajectory of his mind, right? I mean, it was this, and we know it from American history. These savages, I mean, yeah, good for them. I mean, they're really fighting for, for their life and so on. Uh, and it would be difficult to destroy them. But, but we are. We, we, will, we will have to do it, and we will do it. This is something that I would not search for a logical structure here. Uh, and I would leave the contradictions as they are because they're part of that, what I call the Israeli uh, mentality. Uh, it's kind of that DNA of, that, that is born out of the historical experience and, 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 and uh, indoctrination that the society goes for. But, but I think at the heart of it, which is true about every settler colonial project, you have to dehumanize the native and the indigenous. Otherwise, you cannot think big on expulsions or, or genocide. It's kind of like the Benny Morris, isn't it? Kind of the Benny Morris line of, yeah, there was ethnic cleansing, but we should have done more <laughs> or we wouldn't yeah. have the problem we had today if we had done more. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's... Uh, it's, I, it's not, I wish it was only Benny Morris. Right. From him, I didn't expect much more. But I heard the, the dean of faculty of law in the Haifa University explaining to me that had all the Palestinians been expelled from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, there would not have been a conflict. Right. Let alone right. that this is not true, by the way, that the conflict, what he calls the conflict, would have taken place in a different form, but it would have still been there. The idea that this is the way 
to uh, solve the issue by expelling even more people uh, from someone who is dealing with law and international law uh, is again if you if you face them with this astonishment about the immorality of these logical statements they, I, I generally think they don't understand what you're talking about they think they're really building a logical kind of scientific argument here no Palestinians in the West Bank no problem of the West Bank right how the Palestinians are not there doesn't matter but they're not there uh, this is very difficult to deal with uh, because the inner logic of these people says to them they're not only logically right but also morally right uh, but luckily they get responses for enough people from the world who challenge them yeah. how much is it that because what makes I guess the settler colonialism of Israel unique well there are a couple things one is like the anachronistic nature of it right like this happened in a lot of other places but earlier and then the other thing is the coinciding with the Holocaust and mm -hmm. the exploitation of that trauma and devastation to justify ironically and disgustingly ethnically cleansing and genociding other people but how much e how much easier did it make that do you think like and did people really think that they were going to a place where what had been done to them in europe could be done to them here yeah well, well i think it's a bit more, more complicated and it's a mix it's a mixed picture in a way uh on the one hand the historical timing for colonizing palestine is not a good timing it's in a period when the west or you can call it the global north begins to talk about decolonization for the first time at least the left in the west is not at all keen on colonization and begins to see the anti-colonial struggles uh as something it would support uh and so, so zionist colonialism appears actually against the run of history right. you want uh when decolonization starts it enhances colonialism actually so that, that, that creates a problem that is still with Zionism until today. It just takes time for, for, for people to, to understand that. But, but that, uh, the seeds of this problem were, were sown by that historical timing. On the other end, you're absolutely right. What kind of mitigated this problem was the Holocaust. Um, a, 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 because uh, the Holocaust provided the West, even those who were you know, beginning of thinking about decolonization, like the Labour Party in Britain that definitely wanted to decolonize uh, the, the empire, uh, or the left in France that wanted to decolonize the French empire, to, to feel that this is outside the story of colonialism. This belongs to a different history, the history of anti-Semitism. And Zionism provides the best solution uh, for the Jewish question of Europe without any need to deal with the Jewish uh, question of Europe, namely, instead of European asking themselves, not only the Germans, all of those who uh, eagerly helped the Germans to, to eliminate not just Jews, but also other people, they don't have to deal with this racism because Israel is the answer to anti-Semitism and has support of Europe for that. Uh, and, and therefore, if you want, the kind of uh, sentence that accompanies these uh, uh, ideas is that we are creating a small injustice in order to correct a, a big injustice. Uh, and, and that really helps Israel. I, 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 do, I really believe that without the Holocaust, it would have been very difficult to get the international support for a Jewish state uh, that Israel did receive in, in, in 1947. Now to the last bit of your, of your question, were they aware of what they're doing? So, so first of all, uh, you know, as you know, also on, on personal level, being a victim of abuse doesn't mean that you are not come, becoming abuser right. yourself. And, and we've seen it, uh, uh, not just in individuals, we've seen it in, in, in people as well. But I come back to the dehumanization. The important thing was, was, and this is very clear in the Zionist propaganda from very early on, the important thing was to dehumanize the Palestinians. And if it doesn't work, and for some, some of these immigrants who came from Europe were not ideological. So they didn't understand why they had to dehumanize the people who helped them, who showed them how to cultivate the land or share a business with them. They didn't understand why, why they needed to hate them. Uh, uh, in order to 
to overcome this problem when dehumanization was not catching up with everyone was to create this connection that we can see also in Israeli propaganda today between the Nazis and the Palestinian national movement, the Palestinian resistance, by, by Nazifying the Palestinian resistance. Uh, and therefore, you can do to them what you would have done to the Nazis had you had the opportunity of, of revenge. So I, I think this explains it. The last thing I want to say is most of, at least in 1948, most of the Israeli and before that, shall we call them Zionist troops that participated in the ethnic cleansing were not survivors of the Holocaust. The percentage of those who survived the Holocaust and became part of the military apparatus that uh, perpetrated the ethnic cleansing was very minimal. So most of them were not, did not experience the Holocaust. They did experience anti-Semitism uh, in, in, in Europe in the late 19th century and early 20th century, but they did not experience the Holocaust. Uh, and they developed this settler colonial mentality through the uh, 40 years before, the, uh, or 50 years be before 1948, and they already viewed the Arabs uh, in Palestine as, as natives, uh, as, sorry, as savages, uh, as usurpers who took over a land which is not theirs, and, and they allowed themselves to think about how best to get rid, uh, rid of them. In the U.S. right now, there's a lot of discussion about purported anti-Semitism on campus. Uh, Congress just passed this measure saying that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. What is your reaction to all of this? I mean, at a time when Israel is committing mass murder in Gaza, you're seeing this intense focus on alleged anti-Semitism in the U.S. and even trying to equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. That was historian Elon Pape, and how good to hear from him. I really appreciated all of his insight. Uh, and a rare, as you said, Katie, before, extremely rare voice inside Israel. The amount of people who are willing to be honest about Israel's past and its present is very, very small. And uh, he is among those who deserve a lot of appreciation for all he's done to enlighten us about the reality of Israel uh, from its very origins in 1948. It's really exciting to talk to someone who has done so much, I think, to uh, argue for something that should not need arguing, but that is the human rights of Palestinians. And his scholarship uh, ranging from his excellent book, 10 Myths About Israel, to uh, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, to uh, another great book he wrote, The Biggest Prison on Earth, uh, is really enlightening, and everyone should read his books. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, go to usefulidiotspodcast.com to support the show and get bonus content, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. And make sure you get that bonus content because Ilan Pape provides some very interesting uh, historical background into Hamas. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For extended episodes, bonus content, and our weekly Thursday Throwdown episode, please subscribe at usefulidiotspodcast.com. Support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, and wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at UsefulIdiotPod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time.